Hi everyone, a bit of a different video from normal. This is actually going to be a much more personal video than any of the others I have and probably will put out on this channel, and it's one that I sincerely hope is viewed by at least one of the MPs who can make a difference in our country's environmental policy. I have always planned on this channel branching out into climate topics and other non-paleontological discussion around earth sciences eventually. My first science education video on the subject was one that I had planned to release in about five episodes time. But the reason why I'm making a climate-focused video so soon is because of some very surprising and, as someone with my particular academic background, disappointing recent announcements from both the leader of the British Conservative Party, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, and the Secretary of State for the Department of Energy Security and Net Zero, Grant Shapps. Now, these two chaps are in charge of making sure that Great Britain, which is where I'm from and where I am once again, for now at least, living, does everything that it can to limit human-caused climate change. Now, this video is not going to discuss how we know what we know about climate change. If you want videos on that, there are plenty out there. We have decades worth of studies demonstrating that humans are causing climate change. If you want to know about that, I highly recommend either reading the various IPCC reports or watching a number of great videos that I've hopefully remembered to link in the description. In particular, the excellent science communication YouTuber Potholer54, who makes very comprehensive videos debunking misinformation on climate change, and this little short video by Simon Clark, which manages to debunk virtually every single climate change denier's arguments in about two minutes. No, I'm here to discuss a particular policy that was just announced, and why I think it's bizarre that it's being pushed by the men in charge of ensuring that we achieve net zero. And even more bizarre, that it's being touted by them as something that will help us to achieve net zero. But before I begin, I should explain what net zero actually is. Now, the University of Oxford's net zero research initiative defines net zero as the state in which greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere are balanced by the removal of them from the atmosphere. Now, this removal can happen via a number of natural means, in particular its removal via vegetation, rock weathering, or most dramatically by salt marsh and mangrove systems, which lock carbon back into the sediment. But there are also man-made mechanisms of trapping carbon as well, in what's referred to as carbon capture and storage, or CCS, where CO2 is pumped back into source rocks with impermeable overlying layers. But we will discuss CCS a bit later in this video, and the pitfalls with the extent of its proposed usage if these plans go through. To quote the University of Oxford's Net Zero Research Initiative, Net Zero is important because, for CO2 at least, this is the state when global warming stops. The Paris Agreement underlines the need for Net Zero. It requires the states which signed it, including Britain, to achieve a balance between anthropogenic emissions and sources and removals by sinks of greenhouse gases, which they argue needs to happen by the end of the first half of this century. So, if we are to limit warming, we need to stop emitting CO2 as much as possible, replacing it with renewable and non-emitting energy sources with great urgency, and conduct schemes such as coastal wetland restoration, which help us to reabsorb CO2 as much as possible. What happens if we don't do this? Well, frankly a lot. So much, in fact, that I don't know where to begin. So, this video is going to be a little bit erratically structured, and for that I do apologise in advance. 
First, I'm going to talk about what Rishi Sunak and Grant Shapps just announced. Then, we will discuss how climate change is impacting the world right now. Then, we will cover the arguments that Sunak, Shapps, and others have given in favour of the things which they announced. After that, we'll cover the validity of those arguments, and the motives of Sunak and Shapps in making these announcements. And then we'll cover the responses by Labour, the Liberal Democrats, and the Green parties. But first, for the sake of the credibility of this video, I should say a little bit about myself. I am a paleoclimatologist, paleoceanographer, and micropaleontologist, with a background in reconstructing sea level change using salt marsh sediments and foraminifera, as well as climate and ocean circulation change using foraminiferal isotopes. I have several papers either published, submitted, or in various stages of preparation for publication, and I have worked on the effects of climate change on marine and wetland ecosystems. I have worked at the University of Southampton and at Victoria University of Wellington, at the latter of which, in addition to being a PhD student, I have taught about the impacts of climate change on the country's future, with an emphasis on sea level rise, and taught students field and lab techniques. I will stress that I am not an expert on the atmospheric side of climate change, but I know a fair bit about the oceanic side of things though my expertise mainly lies in the field of micropaleontology, and how we can use it to solve climatic, oceanic, and sea level related mysteries in the past. I am also not an expert when it comes to climate modelling or projection. That is to say, I am not saying anything in this video will definitively be devoid of mistakes, especially given the limited time I've had to work on this video, since I want to get it out as soon as possible due to how recent these announcements are, and how urgently action needs to be done to counter them. I will also stress that this is a very opinion-based video, but it's an opinion that is backed up by large amounts of facts and sources, which are linked in the description. Part 1. The Announcement On the 1st of August 2023, Grant Shapps made a frankly bizarre tweet in which, counter to the guidance of every scientific institution, every major review paper, every IPCC report and IEA report, that being the International Panel on Climate Change and the International Energy Agency, and every climate scientist I have ever spoken to, he announced, Today we are saying no to Just Stop Oil and their political wing, the Labour Party. We will power ahead with new oil and gas because it is in the best interests of the British people, of our economy, and of our national security. Just announced, hundreds of new oil and gas licenses, growing the economy, supporting 213,000 jobs, and powering Britain from Britain. He followed that up with this tweet, saying, Labour have surrendered to the criminal tactics of Just Stop Oil, and given in to their destructive demands. They would give Putin the power to blackmail the UK, make 213,000 people jobless, defund our NHS, and put your energy bill at risk. But Conservatives do not surrender. So, this is our man in charge of transitioning us away from fossil fuels, making the announcement that hundreds of new licenses will be issued to do the exact opposite of that. Needless to say, the response to this tweet was extremely negative. My fellow paleoclimatologist, Professor Ian Hill of Cardiff University, characterised this tweet as environmentally catastrophic and fueling the worst extremes of the climate culture wars. Meanwhile, climate lawyer Natalie Jones had this to say, To stay within 1.5 degrees C, we cannot license any more oil and gas fields. Minister for Net Zero seems set on undermining Net Zero. The next election can't come quickly enough. Economy professor and former Green Party politician Molly Scott Cato had this to say, 
They're not just risking the future of life on Earth, they're actually boasting about it, ignoring science and deliberately weaponizing the most serious issue facing the country. They've gone full Trump. Honestly, you have to scroll a very long way to find any responses to this tweet which is positive. The main areas of disbelief seem to be the inexplicable boasting tone of the tweet, the fact that Shapps seems to be proud of his rejection of Just Stop Oil's passionate, albeit arguably often misplaced in who it's targeting, activism, to try to get them to actually listen to scientists. Bafflingly, Grant claims, and Sunak later co-signs, that the Labour Party is a political wing of Just Stop Oil. Not only is this completely untrue, with Labour obviously being much, much older than Just Stop Oil, and the links between the two being tenuous at best, but as we'll discuss in the penultimate part of this video, the Labour Party's response to this announcement makes it clear that this could not be further from the truth. Shapps would also later tweet, claiming that polling suggests that the British population as a whole supports new oil and gas exploration, and that this plan is necessary both to ensure economic growth and, perplexingly, fund the National Health Service, saying, New polling shows Britain backs new UK oil and gas. That's because the choice is simple. Growth or mass unemployment, keeping the lights on or turning your heating off, security or vulnerability, funding or NHS or taking funds away, following the data or surrendering to the mob. I will address the veracity of the claims in Shap's tweet about how beneficial this plan will be both to boosting jobs and funding the NHS later in the video, as well as the claim on the image he shares that this plan will protect the planet by using domestic gas with one quarter the carbon footprint. But before I delve into things that require me to actually start getting into proper reading, I'd like to point your attention towards the Daily Express. Now, the Daily Express are a right-wing tabloid newspaper, so their readership are generally the kinds of people whom you would expect to support the Conservative Party, who have been primed by the paper's poor reporting on climate issues to support this move by the government. How, then, has their reader base responded to this announcement? Well, Contrary to Grant Shapp's tweets, it seems that around 80% of people polled are claiming that they do not support more oil drilling in the North Sea. Anyway, it's time to move away from the Secretary of State for Net Zero and look to the British Prime Minister. His tweets read, I'm backing future oil and gas licensing rounds in the North Sea. Labour would ban these licences, but I want to increase domestic gas production and reduce our reliance on hostile foreign states. Labour's approach would protect Russian jobs. My plan boosts British jobs. I'm investing in a new British industry of green technology to capture and store carbon, including sites in Humber and Aberdeenshire announced today. The two sites alone could support 25,000 jobs and generate over £10 billion, helping us reach net zero and grow the economy. He then tweeted, The Conservative Energy Plan. Drive down energy prices, cut emissions, reduce dependence on foreign energy, increase new investment, create new jobs, and grow the economy. He then said, I will always take the right decisions to secure UK energy and help families with the cost of living. Now, before I start fact-checking all of this, I'd like to point out that while Sunak here claims that North Sea drilling would reduce energy prices, this is in fact the exact opposite of what Shap's predecessor and the current Conservative Party chairman, Greg Hans, had to say last year, where he called extracting North Sea gas lowering prices a myth. Shapps also made this tweet, claiming that due to the relative carbon footprints of domestic versus imported gases, we would be harming the planet by not extracting that gas. 
This frankly makes very little sense to me before I even get into what scientific literature has to say, since surely overseas gas is still going to be shipped somewhere and burned by someone else, if not the UK, once it's been extracted. And as far as the global emissions go, even if the UK's individual emissions were reduced by switching from global to local gas sources, these plants still add new carbon emissions on top of that, from the hundreds of new wells that wouldn't have otherwise been dug. Even if it doesn't increase the UK's emissions, and we assume that none of the gas dug up in Britain is transported to other countries, invoking even more CO2 per unit of distance, it increases the global emissions by humankind. It all rings forth as having an extremely Anglo-centric view, as though the steps we take to make ourselves cleaner don't have any effect on those around us. If every country took the let's clean up our act by digging up oil and gas here and not importing it, then every country would still be digging for oil and gas and still doing the exact opposite of of what needs to be done according to every major scientific body. My own MP, Conservative Bob Seeley, had this to say, Good, absurd that we're importing a relatively clean fuel, such as gas, from the Middle East whilst ignoring our own resources. It's also very polluting to import it halfway around the world. Looks like common sense is breaking out. Before I start digging into the science, I want to make something a bit clear here. I am biased. I am biased towards avoiding mass extinction, towards limiting human suffering. My immediate knee-jerk reaction to these tweets was, frankly, utter horror and disbelief. It felt like everything I had been working towards as a climate scientist was worthless, because no matter what quality of work I put out, all I could think was, these people don't care and they won't listen. But I'm not here to let these concerns clown my mind. I am going to try to be objective. I am going to review the claims of the politicians and try to erase my biases as much as possible. Because I sincerely hope, unlikely though it is, that at least one member of parliament watches this upcoming review and that it causes them to at least reconsider their positions. But first, on to part two, the state of climate change right now. Well, although the weather wasn't that great here in the UK, the planet overall just experienced its hottest July in recorded human history. The preceding June was also the hottest June in recorded human history. To quote the latest IPCC report attached in the description, human activities, principally through emissions of greenhouse gases, have unequivocally caused global warming, with global surface temperatures reaching 1.1 degrees C above 1850 to 1900 in 2011 to 2020. To make things worse, Current emissions reduction plans worldwide are not at a scale to avoid warming of more than 1.5 degrees, or even 2 degrees. Based on the IPCC synthesis, this increase in global temperatures has had a significant effect on human health, with increased mortality worldwide due to extreme heat waves, the spread of formerly tropical diseases poleward, and increased loss of livelihoods and culture as more and more areas become unlivable, or have to deal with more extreme weather events. In some parts of the world, temperatures are reaching levels that are difficult or even impossible for humans to survive for significant amounts of time. Extreme weather has led to significant decreases in crop productivity, and appear to have forced the displacement of 3% of the population of the continent of Africa since the 1960s. Extreme heat waves are becoming much more frequent globally, with temperatures now being reached in some parts of the world that would have been impossible without human intervention, according to this study by Mariam Zachariah and colleagues. Thanks to these temperatures, the resulting water scarcity in many parts of the world are having a rapid and 
devastating effect on global agriculture. These increased temperatures are also driving much larger and more intense autumnal wildfires, burning huge areas of land. In the description is a link to a great thread by Professor Catherine Hiho on the links between climate change and fires. It is increasingly also being realized that increased temperatures are both providing energy to hurricanes and typhoons, allowing them to spin faster, and increasing the amount of water that these events can take up. Both of these events mean that we both are getting and should expect to continue to get harder and harder storms, inflicting horrific damage to our cities, settlements, and habitats. That study that I've shown by Lauren Mudd also provides evidence for an increase in hurricane frequency with continuing warming, and models that as continuing into the future as well. In our planet's oceans, things are also very far from ideal. A very recent study has found that Atlantic Meridional Ocean Circulation, or AMOC, is not only slowing, but may collapse as soon as within the next two years. The slowdown of AMOC has already been linked to a significant loss of oxygen in the North Atlantic, which has the potential to significantly decrease the region's ability to support large quantities of life. Even excluding the influence of AMOC on this, as water temperatures rise, water loses its ability to hold as much dissolved oxygen, particularly in the mixed layer below the initial surface waters. All in all, around 2% of the dissolved oxygen has been lost, and the spread of dead zones, i.e. areas with insufficient oxygen to support vertebrate life, is considered to be becoming a serious global threat to fish stocks. On the topic of the ocean, increased temperatures as well as decreased pH due to increased CO2 in the oceans has led to extensive coral bleaching, with an unprecedented event currently being documented from the Caribbean. In Australia, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute have reported that some 90% of all corals have undergone at least some bleaching event, with half of the corals having been killed by the temperatures in recent decades. Despite some regrowth from one specific species well adapted to these changes, climate change is causing a devastating drop in the diversity of coral species in Australian reefs. And it is predicted that under 1.5 degrees of warming, between 70 and 90% of all global corals will die. The increase in dissolved CO2 in the ocean as well as the associated acidification, are also having a noticeable effect on shells, in particular the shells of planktic organisms which are essential to the ocean food chain. When ocean chemistry is adjusted to that expected at the year 2100 under current CO2 emission rates, Pteropods, like the one shown here, which are a group of tiny floating snails that are essential as a food source to many, many species of fish, completely lose their ability to produce shells. This is actually already becoming a problem for the planktic forams, uh, another group of important planktonic organisms, whose shells in the modern ocean are 76% thinner than those produced by specimens collected of the same species by HMS Challenger in the 19th century. And this is not just the case for planktic foram species. Species which live in the seafloor are also undergoing this kind of devastating shell loss. If this continues, the effects on the oceanic food web, both in the planktic and benthic environments, will be devastating, and the loss of calcifying plankton and large amounts of calcifying benthic species will lead to a dramatic loss in ocean biodiversity. The rapidity of this modern increase in CO2 is simply too fast for a lot of calcifying organisms to be able to adapt to it. All of these factors threaten to devastate global fisheries and everyone dependent upon them. We're already seeing this with the king crabs, 
in Alaska, and changes to water temperature are having a significant effect on the ocean food web here off the coast of the UK as well. For example, one of the key prey species in northern England and Scotland's shallow waters is the sand eel. These are a staple food for many seabirds, in particular the iconic Atlantic puffin. These are a cold water dependent species, and thanks to climate change have been migrating further and further north. This places puffins and other seabirds dependent on them at risk of extinction, having to migrate further and further from their nests to find prey, and finding less prey when they find them. The loss of sand eels from these waters are already causing a significant decrease in puffin chick survival. These changes in water temperature in the North Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico and the poleward shift in ecosystems types associated with it are predicted to have a significant influence on the distribution of suitable habitats for 9 out of the 12 apex predator species within this region, many of which are commercially valuable species and are expected to experience an up to 70% loss in suitable habitat between 2019 and 2099. And then there's the thing everyone knows the ocean is doing thanks to climate change. Rising. Sea level rise brings with it increased coastal erosion, increased coastal flooding, increased aquifer salination, and therefore decreased terrestrial water supply in coastal communities, habitat loss, and increased reach for damaging storm surges. Globally, the melting of continental ice sheets and the thermal expansion of seawater have caused what tide gauge records indicate is between 1.1 and 1.2 millimetres per year of sea level rise between 1901 and 1990, according to these two studies. This has accelerated significantly to over 3.3 millimetres per year during the satellite era, and it is still undergoing a rapid acceleration, as discussed in this study by Nera Metal, which is linked in the description. The precise drivers of what exactly is causing this acceleration and the different intervals of acceleration in it are discussed in this excellent paper by Frederick et al., which I've also linked in the description. According to Michaela King et al. in 2020, the largest driver of sea level rise globally is currently considered to be the melting of the Greenland ice sheet, which is currently accelerating, with a 14% increase in discharge between 1989 and 1999 and 2007 and 2018. It should be noted, there is some significant disagreement between the actual mass of ice lost in this period, with King et al. 2020 arguing roughly twice as much mass loss in the Greenland ice sheet as was estimated by Zo et al. also 2020, uh, and this uncertainty could have significant ramifications for future modelling of sea level rise. But, in any case, satellite evidence is strongly indicating that the Greenland ice sheet has now entered a dynamic state of continual mass loss, meaning that it will continue to retreat and drive sea level rise even in the event that climate change were to be halted, according to King et al's findings. As a result of this, and other processes addressed in this chapter, sea level rise is expected to continue into the future even if significant action is taken to reduce climate change. An additional exacerbating factor is that the Thwaites Glacier in Antarctica, currently thought to contribute around 4% of global mean sea level rise, according to Petit Atal in 2021, and holds about an extra 65 centimetres of global sea level equivalent in water mass, according to Morlinghurm et al., is being increasingly destabilised by warm water undercutting, and considered at high risk of collapsing prior to 2030, as discussed by Petit et al. and Scambos et al., both in 2021, I've attached a link to the press conference on this, so you can read about it. So, with everything going on, you might think that the British government would make tackling climate change its top priority. 
right? Um, I, I certainly did. Uh, on the 4th of January this year, our then new Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, announced his top five priorities, and I was very curious to see where climate change would lie on that list. Um, and he announced these in a letter to the country published on the British government's website. So, so let's look at priority number one. That's got to be climate change, right? No. Okay, surely priority two. No, that's not about climate change either. Priority three. N no? Uh, uh, priority no, not priority four either? Is this a joke? Well, surely the fifth priority also has to be about, are you freaking kidding me? So no, tackling climate change and ensuring that our world is livable to us and future generations is not one of the top five priorities for the British government right now. In 2021, a study published in the journal Nature by Dan Welby and colleagues used a global energy systems model to calculate that the only way for us to have a 50% chance of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees C above pre-industrial levels is to keep at least 60% of unextracted oil and methane and 90% of unextracted coal in the ground. The Conservative plan to, and I quote, max out the oil and gas reserves in the North Sea, make it clear that it is not their intention to comply with these findings. The phrase max out is defined as reaching an upper limit, or pushing to a limit, or an extreme. This indicates that they want to extract as much oil or gas as is possible to extract from the North Sea. No consideration is given to the fact that if we are to meet our Paris Agreement targets, and surely we need to include the gas we export in those targets as well, then we need to leave at least 60% of it there. This is also entirely inconsistent with the findings of the International Energy Agency, whose major 2020 report, which was peer-reviewed by a huge body of researchers, said, and I quote, Reaching net zero by 2050 requires nothing short of a total transformation of our energy system that underpin our economies, and recommended that no new oil and gas fields be extracted from or explored for extraction, arguing that it will not be possible for the planet to reach net zero if we do so. Under their net zero scenario, oil production would need to decline by almost 75% between now and 2050, and natural gas usage would need to decline by 55%. These actions by the Sunak government completely ignore the recommendations of this report, including their recommended roadmap for viably achieving net zero. In short, the Sunak government's claims that burning this oil and gas will help Britain achieve net zero go directly against the overwhelming scientific consensus on how net zero can be achieved. Part 3. Fact-checking Shaps and Sunak's Tweets So back to the tweets earlier, one thing that kept coming up in Sunak and Shaps' tweets is the fact that if we're not importing tons of gas from far away, and instead it's coming from British waters, that saves the majority of emissions. However, according to the national statistics provided by the Department of Energy and Net Zero, 80% of British oil and gas are exported from Britain, and if it's highly emissive to import oil and gas, it stands to reason that it also is to export it, and that the number of ships and thus emissions released from exporting oil and gas will probably rise to similar levels to those importing it once we become more energy independent. Neither Sunak nor Shaps have said anything about banning the export of this oil and gas to other countries in order to curb emissions through the ships exporting it. So we can assume that they still want export of oil and gas to go ahead. 
Furthermore, Sunak told reporters on ITV News that using domestic oil and gas saves between two and four times the amount of CO2 emissions produced by shipping abroad. So, is this true? This figure comes from a press release by the North Sea Transition Authority, or NSTA, a wholly government-owned company which is responsible for maximising the economic recovery of oil from the North Sea, securing the maximum value of economically recoverable petroleum is recovered from the strata beneath British waters, and in so doing, take appropriate steps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as much as considered reasonable. What I just said is taken verbatim from their site in 2018, according to the company's Wikipedia article, though unfortunately the site at this time was not stored on the web archive. So I want to make it clear that the data that I'm going to discuss came directly from a company which, while government owned, exists to fulfil the primary purpose of ensuring that we make money out of the fossil fuels in the North Sea. This does not come from any kind of peer-reviewed journal article or report, nor are the data that these interpretations are based on available or linked from the press release that they come from. All we have to go off is this press release from a company whose entire reason for existing is indicative of bias towards the fossil fuel industry. So anyway, this, dare I say, suspect data from the NSTA does corroborate the Prime Minister's claim. They found that 63% of Britain's gas comes from other countries, with 187 million barrels of oil equivalent of that gas being directly transferred to Britain via pipeline, and 157 million barrels of oil equivalent being shipped here as liquefied gas. They found that British gas has a carbon intensity of 21 kilograms of CO2 released per barrel of oil equivalent of gas, while all liquefied gas imports release significantly higher amounts of carbon per barrel of oil equivalent, at between 33 in Norwegian gas and 90 in Peruvian gas. The global average was 79 barrels of oil equivalent, so 79 versus 21 does seem like a lot. Uh, For the sake of simplicity, I'm going to start referring to emissions as kilograms per BOE instead of kilograms of carbon dioxide per barrel of oil equivalent, since I don't want you to get bogged down in the terminology and miss the numbers when they're what matters. But this is where the press release's bias becomes clear. You see, they only compare 21 kilograms per BOE with the average of liquefied gas imports to the UK. So when the Prime Minister claims that Britain producing its own gas releases two to four times less gas than the stuff being imported from overseas, he's only referring to 157 BOE of gas imported as liquefied gas, and not to 187 BOE of gas that's transported via pipeline. In short, he is actually talking about the carbon intensity of Britain's gas in comparison to less than half of what's actually imported to Britain. The NSTA's press release doesn't even address the carbon intensity of the gas which is piped to the UK, most of which comes from Norway, so it's hardly travelling an extreme distance. The reason why they don't discuss this is because it contradicts their own narrative about the eco-friendliness of British gas. In a Guardian article on the NSTA press release, they discuss that the gas which arrives in the UK via pipeline produces just 18 kilograms of carbon per BOE, which is 3 kilograms per BOE less than is released to produce British gas. 
So using Norwegian gas is more beneficial to reducing Britain's carbon emissions than drilling and using more of our own gas. Therefore, by the standard that the Conservative Party are using to justify British gas being more environmentally friendly, Norwegian gas is more environmentally friendly, and piping it here is. So, we have already caught the NSTA in some very blatantly questionable presentation of their data, in a way that is deeply misleading to the average reader. You can read the full NSTA press release in the link in the description to check that I haven't made any mistakes here. But things actually get even worse for Sunak and Shap's narrative when we start looking into the findings of an actually impartial organisation, the International Energy Agency, or IEA. In one of the footnotes of page 9 of their report on emissions from oil and gas operations in net zero transitions, they note that the actual combustion of natural gas releases 320 kilograms of CO2 per BOA. Wait, what? 320 kilograms per barrel equivalent is a lot more than the 79 released by liquefied gas, according to the NSTA, and the 21 released by British gas. So, why do the NSTA give figures so much lower than the IEA? What on earth is going on? Well, you see... The NSTA were only providing the emissions generated by producing the gas, not combusting it. Liquefied gas requires a lot of energy to generate the pressures needed to transform it from gas to liquid for transport. The NSTA's figures are therefore even more misleading, because they don't talk about how much energy is released when we actually burn the gases and compare the eco-friendliness that way. Channel 4 also found this when they fact-checked this claim, and you can read their conclusions in the description. The vast majority of gas emissions come not from the production of gas, but from burning it. Instead of British gas being two to four times cleaner in terms of CO2 release, there's actually only a 17% difference in total carbon emissions between them. In short, the Prime Minister has effectively been lying to the British public to make it seem as though British fossil fuels are much cleaner than they actually are. And again, there has been no mention of regulations being put in place to stop these profit-driven companies from transporting this gas once they've built it anywhere else in the world, and no mention of any regulations to stop these countries from liquefying the gas in order to cut down on emissions during the production phase. If this gas is liquefied and transported at a larger scale, then its overall emissions will be no different from that of the greatly elevated levels of the imported liquefied gas discussed in the NSTA's report. In short, we have no reason to believe that enhanced British gas production will be any cleaner than international imported gas, and even if they did reduce the carbon footprint of the UK, they would still overall increase the planet's carbon emissions as they are transported elsewhere and burnt elsewhere. Until we have guarantees that none of this gas will be liquefied or shipped abroad, any claim that British gas is cleaner and helping us achieve net zero is unjustifiable given the current data. All we have is an increase in extraction at a time when we simply cannot keep doing this for the reasons discussed in the previous chapter. Hundreds of new sites for oil and gas extraction will not in any way help us save the planet. But all of this has been talking about gas. What about oil? Grant Shapp's tweets about how the planet is saying no to just stop oil was particularly odd to me. Even if we exclude the impacts of oil extraction and burning on climate change for a minute, if the oil being pumped were to spill, that would already risk an ecological disaster. But then we need to address 
Sunak's claim that using British oil will save two to four times our country's carbon emissions. And most importantly, will it save the overall planet's carbon emissions or only Britain's, but shift those exported emissions elsewhere? I think you can tell where this is going. An analysis by the Norwegian independent energy research company Rystad found that the UK's energy intensity, that is the amount of CO2 released in order to produce and transport oil as a fuel resource, is 21 kilograms per BOE, while the energy intensity of our neighbour Norway is only 8. We are lower than Denmark, which produces 27 kilograms per BOE, but we're still higher than the global carbon intensity average for oil production, which is 19. The high energy consumption of UK oil pumping rigs comes from the fact that the oil is pumped using gas and diesel turbines rather than electric turbines, which could significantly reduce our emissions. This RISAT analysis again doesn't talk about the carbon intensity of burning the oil, which, like gas, would be roughly the same irrespective of where that oil comes from, and makes up the vast bulk of emissions associated with oil usage. But oil also comes with an additional refining process in order to turn it into petrol, diesel, and other usable fractions, and the amount of carbon emitted refining that oil is more than the entire amount of CO2 released producing gas. So no, continuing to look for oil isn't going to help us fight climate change either. But hey, I hear you ask, what about Britain's energy security? Isn't that important? Well, as John Crace points out in this Guardian article, the companies pumping out these fossil fuels would be selling them on the global market, and they'll be selling them at global market prices. If situations like the war in Ukraine, God forbid, continues to affect oil or gas prices, or other disasters or crises affect the supply, that will still affect the price of oil traded on the global marketplace. As mentioned earlier, this is exactly what Shapps' predecessor Greg Hands was referring to when he called claims that extracting more gas from the North Sea would reduce British energy prices a myth. And once again, once these companies have pumped out that oil and gas, it's theirs. They can ship it wherever they like. Wind, wave, solar, or tidal power are fixed in their location once installed. Renewables actually have a chance of making the UK energy independent, but this is simply not going to do that. As discussed in that Guardian article that I showed earlier by Sandra Laville, According to Chris Stark, the chief executive of the Climate Change Committee, producing new oil and gas extraction could also weaken UK diplomacy to encourage other countries to adopt more ambitious climate policies. It would also inevitably grow the global market for fossil fuels. So these plans go directly against the Climate Committee's advice and will expand the marketplace and thus the economic appetite to keep burning fossil fuels instead of transitioning to clean energy. If we are selling more fossil fuels on the cheap, where's the incentive for other countries to stop? But then there's the issue of the longevity of this resource. How can Britain be secure in its energy future on a resource that is finite. As discussed earlier, in order to meet our Paris Agreement targets, we can only extract an absolute minimum of 40% of what's in the North Sea. Yet if we ignore this and power ahead, will we even be able to do this for very long before it all collapses and everyone working on it loses their jobs? and the communities this plan claims to help are left to wallow in poverty because the government didn't prioritise infinitely renewable energy sources that could similarly have helped keep these people employed. Well, according to a 2017 University of Edinburgh report discussed here by The Times, 
their analysis indicates that based on the current extraction rates and the amount of oil and gas detected in the North Sea reserves, there's only around 10 years worth of oil and gas remaining in the region, and that it would be expected that by 2027, there would be no economic value in the North Sea oil field at all. However, sadly for the planet, though perhaps fortunately for the people Sunak claims to want to help protect the jobs of, in October of last year, a report was published by Offshores Energy UK, which reported the mapping of an additional 30 years worth of oil reserves. Their report also includes a chart of oil and gas wells to start producing after they have been successfully prospected, and these data, which they collected from our old reliable, in quotation marks, friends at the NSTA, indicates that it should take around four to eight years. But really, the truth is, none of this even matters. If these communities do have 40 years worth of job security, then that's good for them. But if we're to meet our targets and prevent more than 1.5 degrees of warming and cataclysmic extinction level events, surely this is a secondary issue. And I know that sounds harsh, but shouldn't the government run by the needs of the many outweighing the needs of the few? And as said, this job security is for an amount of time that sources greatly disagree on, and doesn't seem to equate with energy security. Since these drilling permits are being licensed to for-profit companies, who can then sell that oil anywhere in the world without even needing to run by British workers. Also, if we expect the oil to run out in the next 40 years, surely we also expect the number of jobs to be being downsized in the next 25 years or so, as the wells we already have are exhausted of oil. There is no job security in the long term with this plan. Of course, the government does need to find ways to support communities who are historically and still presently dependent on fossil fuel extraction. But we need to do this in a way that does not prolong increasing emissions of CO2. Surely, programs where wave and offshore wind power installations are established around these communities would be similarly beneficial to them in terms of jobs. In this interview with Sky News, which I've altered the picture of to avoid copyright infringement claims, Grant Shapps justifies that these new fossil fuel explorations will increase our energy security, only for the presenter to point out that if the British government have no control over the price of energy, with licenses belonging to international companies and the oil sold off on the international market, the argument for energy security makes no sense. Here's how their conversation goes. It's disingenuous to say that without, without, the, without this drilling that we're not going to have any gas or oil in the UK, isn't it? No, no, of course, we'll import the difference. So uh, this is exactly the point I'm making. We'll import the difference. And when you do that, be aware that our principal way of making up the gap is through liquid natu natural gas, LNG, and it contains four times the amount of carbon. Here, Grant tells us that liquefied gas contains four times the amount of carbon as the gas that we produce from our own resources. I simply do not know where this figure is coming from. None of the papers I have found have argued that LNG has four times more carbon in it per unit volume than the gas transported in pipes. It does, however, have roughly that level of carbon intensity when it's produced, as we discussed earlier. But also, as we discussed earlier, this is based on highly misleading figures from the NSTA, which exclude references to the actual combustion costs, um, including which makes this difference much smaller. As the gas that we can actually uh, bring into this country uh, ourselves from our own resources. How much of the gas that we produce in the UK is actually sold in the UK and is actually used here. 
So there is a mix. That's absolutely true. But what's important Can you here figures? is the, because it seems that scientists have tried to get these figures out of the government for a long time and have been unable to. Yes, the re, the reason it's I, I can tell you actually because yesterday I was in Teesside uh, at uh, a one of our major gas terminals where they take gas from thirty different fields in the North Sea and they process it. And I was actually having this discussion with them. The reason why it's a complicated figure is some of it is processed and exported uh, and then refined and re-imported. So gas and oil doesn't flow in a single direction. It also varies all the time with those pipelines that we have set up. It's not the British government who's taking the, this oil and gas out. It's international companies. And, and the British government has no control over, you just said that, that you've just explained very clearly to our viewers how the market works, how the, the gas and oil that's extracted is goes to the company and then it is distributed around the world. Some of it comes back to the UK, some of it's sold on the open market. It, it's not coming straight back to the UK. That That is not a given. You're also not an able in any way able to control the price that we get for it. So you're not controlling the supply. You're not controlling the price. It's international energy companies who are. Well, Why does that give I, us I, energy security? I just, I, I just want to sort of make sure we're factually on the same uh, sort of uh, in the same place here. Uh, when I was looking at that uh, terminal, gas terminal yesterday in Teesside, it's connected to 30 fields in the uh, in the North Sea, uh, that gas has to route back to the UK. There is so while Grant Shapps is correct here that the gas has to be routed back to the UK, he is only correct if it's being transported without being liquefied and shipped. And just because it's routed to the UK doesn't mean that there's any reason to believe that the UK will be its final destination before it's combusted. As the presenter previously mentioned, this gas could get piped out of the UK and then back to the UK, and frankly could go anywhere. There's another place for it to go by and large. Uh, it comes back to the UK, it is processed here, and it is either used, used directly... Here. And it's either, as I said, but primarily used here. In fact, the, the, the terminal I was at yesterday, for example, uh, processes about half of the gas which is domestic. Shapps then claims that the majority of gas is used here, despite the fact that the majority of gas currently coming from the UK is exported. He does not provide any evidence to support his claim because the evidence does not exist. Next, we go on to the Prime Minister's interview, which was also on Sky News. Well, it's great to be in Scotland to strengthen our energy security with more licenses for the North Sea, uh, but also speed us on our way to net zero with carbon capture and storage. In the first 10 seconds of his interview, Sunak tells Sky News that this plan will help Britain achieve net zero through carbon capture and storage. This is quite a controversial topic as to whether or not it will or actually won't help Britain achieve net zero, and I'm going to talk about it in detail after we cover this interview, as there is a lot to cover there. Now, when it comes to our energy security, we're still going to need oil and gas. 25% of our energy will come from oil and gas, even in 2050. Okay, so Sunak claims that by 2050, around 25% of Britain's energy will still need to come from oil and gas. At the moment, however, 78.4% of Britain's energy comes from oil and gas, and Sunak fails to explain how expanding oil and gas production in the North Sea will be bringing that down to a much lower number in order to validate the claim he just made. Far better that we get that from here at home, better for the economy, better for our energy security, better for jobs, and better for climate emissions rather than shipping it here from halfway around the country. So that's why we've got more North Sea oil and gas licenses being announced. But also we're speeding us on our path to net zero with carbon capture and storage. Two new clusters announced today, including here in Aberdeenshire. That's going to be fantastic. This is a new technology that Britain can lead the world in, and that's going to be happening right here, which I'm incredibly excited about, and the jobs and opportunities that it will create. How do you square those two things, though? Because in, in announcing all of these new licenses, aren't you just extending the fossil fuel industry and um, wrecking your own net zero pledge? At the same time. I think it's really important for everyone to recognise that even in 2050, when we are at net zero, it is forecast that around a quarter of our energy needs will still come from oil and gas. That yes, but just because Britain will hopefully have reached net zero by then, doesn't necessarily make that true for the rest of the planet. If this gas is shipped across the world, especially if it's shipped in liquefied form, it could still contribute to climate change, even if Britain isn't the one doing the burning. 
That's why technologies like carbon capture and storage are important. But what is important then is that we get that oil and gas in the best possible way. And that means getting it from here at home. Better for our energy security, not reliable. As we've just made clear, just because the energy is produced here does not mean it's better for energy security, since these companies can do whatever they want from it, and we are not putting strong regulations to stop them from selling the gas on the international market. Furthermore, if the Conservatives do put those regulations on them in order to increase Britain's energy security, then we run the risk of giving those companies a monopoly on our fossil fuel inputs, allowing them to simply charge Britain however much they want. ...on foreign dictators, better for jobs, for example 100,000 supported here in Scotland, but also better for the climate, because if we're going to need it, far better to have it here at home rather than shipping it here from halfway around the world with two, three, four times the amount of carbon emissions versus the oil and gas we have here at home, so it's entirely consistent with our plans to get to net zero. All of the papers that I have found have claimed that in order to have a chance of stopping climate change in its tracks, we need to leave between 60 and 75% of fossil fuels in the ground. Claiming that burning it when burning fossil fuels makes up the vast majority of emissions we get from them is going to help us fight climate change simply doesn't agree with the findings of any peer-reviewed study or any respected scientific organisation which I have been able to find. Carbon capture plans like these, though, will be doing nowhere near enough to offset the scale of emissions if you approve Rosebank. So can you confirm today that you won't be going ahead with Rosebank? Well, licensing decisions are obviously made in the normal way. But what I'd say is it entirely consistent with transitioning to net zero, that we use the energy we've got here at home because we're going to need it for decades. So far better for our economy, for jobs and for climate emissions. So we get it from here rather than shipping it from halfway around the world. But carbon capture and storage is a fantastic new technology that will help us transition to net zero. It means we can take carbon from industrial processes and then sequester it in the ground. We're very lucky here in Britain that we are poised to lead the world in this new technology and industry because of our expertise, the skills of the incredible people working here, the infrastructure that you see behind me, the pipelines going out, and then the North Sea, where the geology is perfect for sequestering and storing this carbon. So, so here Rishi Sunak has completely failed to answer the reporter's question about carbon capture and storage in the proposed Rosebank operations, and how they are in no way big enough in scale to counteract the new emissions that would come from this project. Again, we'll talk about carbon capture and storage after we've covered this interview. But everyone should be excited about the prospect of us leading the world, transitioning to net zero, and strengthening our energy security. That's the right balance, and that's what I'm delivering as Prime Minister. Many people will see, especially in this area, will say, you know, we've been here before, we've heard promises like this before. Can you confirm that with this announcement today, that the scheme here at St Fergus will actually be operational and will go ahead? Yeah, well, it's incredibly exciting news for the Acorn cluster here in Aberdeenshire, as well as the other clusters we have around the UK. And this is businesses, industry coming together, and now being able to talk to government formally about how they plan to deliver carbon capture and storage, so that collectively we can strengthen our energy security, but also transition to net zero, but importantly, lead the world in this new technology. And Scotland is well placed to do that, and that's why I'm excited to be here making this announcement. I've been talking to people here who are involved. They're incredibly optimistic about what the future holds, and I'm delighted to be backing them. And to change my last question, so isn't all this softening on green policies not a bit of a knee-jerk reaction um, to keeping Uxbridge because of you, Les? Aren't you worried about alienating the many voters who do want you to take strong action on climate change, especially in the blue wall where the Lib Dems make it so when I was Prime Minister, I became Prime Minister, I set up a brand new department for energy security and net zero. And I think both of those things are important. Of course I'm committed to net zero, but I'm also committed to our energy security. And we will get to net zero in a proportionate and pragmatic way that doesn't unnecessarily burden families with costs or hassle that they don't really need in their lives right now. I'm really in this segment, Rishi briefly discusses that transitioning to net zero risks burdening families with enhanced costs that they don't really need right now. Transitioning away from fossil fuels doesn't really risk enhancing the cost to families since, as we'll discuss in a later segment, where we talk about videos by Second Thought and Potholer54, the price of solar energy, for example, is cheaper to produce than even coal, which used to be the cheapest. The only difference is the level of profitability, but that's a topic for a later segment of the video. Proud of the UK's track record. We've decarbonized faster than any other country in the G7 group of large countries. We are leading the world in new technologies like carbon capture and storage, which I'm announcing today, so I feel very optimistic about the future. Okay, so now we've reached the end of that interview, and we need to actually talk about carbon capture and storage. Carbon capture and storage, or CCS, has overwhelmingly and repeatedly been the justification that Shaps and Sunak have given for why all of the additional exploration for oil and gas in the North Sea is actually okay since we can in theory use that technology to offset a large amount of what we produce. Now, it's pretty safe to say that CCS has been a controversial topic as a means of tackling climate change. On the one hand, you have the incredible Guardian columnist and staunch environmentalist George Monbiot, who argues this. Carbon capture and storage has been promised for 20 years. 
It has never materialized and never will. Its sole purpose is to create the impression that oil and gas drilling is compatible with a habitable planet. Any politician promoting it is working for the fossil fuel industry. On the other hand, we have Ezin Serin of the London School of Economics's Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change, who told iNews that CCS is virtually the only technological option we have if we want to get deep emissions reductions, and called CCS a necessity, not an option. Serin has extensively argued for the integration of CCS in Britain's net zero strategy, and hopes that CCS can be used to help us achieve negative emissions by developing technology to help us absorb and store atmospheric CO2. Now, I am quite happy to believe that both George Monbiot and Ezin Serin are arguing in good faith here, and they both seem to be very passionate about helping the UK tackle climate change despite their differences in opinion. I will be attaching Serin's article in favour of CCS in the description so that you can learn more. In fact, in the iNews article I mentioned earlier, Serin did express concerns that fossil fuel companies are using CCS as a get-out-of-jail-free card, and that prioritising investment in CCS over investment in renewable energies might be sending the wrong signal and justifying or encouraging companies to drill more rather than emphasising the development of renewable energy. This is one of the more vocal pro-CCS academics saying this, so I think it's safe that these are not just the words of George Monbiot. CCS can be, and even according to its defenders, is being used to justify greenwashing by the fossil fuel industry. So, is CCS able to make a significant enough difference to half or divide by four the total carbon intensity of British oil and gas, since these two to four times cleaner are the numbers that Rishi Sunak was claiming in all his interviews, tweets, and speeches. Let's do some reading and find out. Professor Stuart Hazeldine, a specialist in CCS at the University of Edinburgh, told The Guardian in this article from just after the announcements that, and I quote, Announcing more CCS schemes at the same time as approving 100 plus new oil and gas drilling licenses is like ordering a truckload of cigarettes for someone trying to give up smoking. He argued that this announcement only makes sense as a way to help us achieve net zero if we also pair CCS with an increase in renewable energy, not an increase in oil and gas licenses, as Sunak and Shaps have announced. Hasseldine does agree, however, that CCS is absolutely necessary to achieve net zero, much as Essen Seren did in that earlier article. Professor Jim Watson of the University College London's Institute of Sustainable Resources also argued in this same article that CCS could be viewed as a get-out-of-jail-free card by the fossil fuel industry, the exact same phrasing that Seren used. And he discusses a number of both false starts in the history of implementing CCS in Britain and the failure of a number of other CCS projects to store the amount of carbon they had previously announced abroad. On this basis, Watson noted that the time frame for CCS to store 20 and 30 million tonnes of CO2 in North Sea sediments, as the Sunak government have announced they plan to do, might not be possible to achieve before their deadline of doing so is up. So basically, all of the prominent experts in favour of CCS that I have been able to find quotes from acknowledge that the technology is being misused by the fossil fuel industry to justify increased drilling, and that the way that Rishi Sunak's government planned to implement it, in conjunction with a dramatic increase in fossil fuel extraction, is unlikely to have a significant effect on the rapid increase in CO2 emissions that will result from these new plans. In short, Rishi Sunak is, 
intentionally or not, misleading the public when he repeats at nauseam that CCS is going to really help Britain achieve net zero when performed in conjunction with increased drilling. For CCS to do the kind of things that people like Serin, Hasseldine, and Watson suggest, we need to use it in conjunction with a rapid increase in renewable energy usage in the UK. But, shortly before making this announcement, Rishi Sunak reversed plans by his own government to re-legalise the establishment of onshore wind farms in Britain. This reversal is a policy opposed by two-thirds of his own party's voters. So, we need to go to part four. Is this necessary? So, if everything that Sunak and his allies keep repeating is either untrue, misleading, or indicates that other factors are being prioritised over tackling the greatest threat to our civilization and every ecosystem on this planet, that being climate change, is this strategy actually necessary to keep Britain's energy costs down? Here is what Kieran Jenkins of Channel 4 News had to say on the matter. So do we need more North Sea oil and gas extraction to power the energy we use in the UK? Well, first of all, we often talk about oil and gas together, but there are big differences in how they're produced, what we do with it all and where it all goes. So let's look at what happens, first of all, to all that oil being pumped out of the North Sea. How much of it stays here in the UK? Well, about 20 percent of North Sea oil is for domestic UK consumption. Most of it, 80 percent, is exported worldwide into the international market. And that's why the government's critics say we're already extracting more oil than we need and selling it overseas, and they argue that's no good for the planet. Now, let's turn to gas. Most homes in the UK are heated with gas. And Rishi Sunak says rather than importing it from hostile states and playing into Vladimir Putin's hands, he wants more gas to come from Britain and claims this will bring down bills. Now, the UK is a net importer of gas, but even before the invasion of Ukraine, Russia provided just... 4% of our gas in the UK. Most of our gas imports come from, not very hostile, Norway. So household energy bills soared, not because of Russian imports, but because the price we pay for gas is set by traders on the global market. And that price increased after Russia invaded Ukraine. So would extracting more gas from the North Sea deliver Rishi Sunak's promise today of British energy from Britain at a cheaper cost. Well, he can't force companies that extract North Sea gas to sell it in the UK, nor at a discounted price. And many North Sea projects are backed by multinational companies from countries including Norway, the United Arab Emirates and China. And the gas they extract is traded internationally at international prices. And right now, there's nothing stopping them uh, exporting this gas overseas from the UK. So while Rishi Sunak argues that extracting more oil and gas will increase homegrown supplies and bring down prices, that's clearly in dispute. And we asked the government to clarify or provide the data to back up these claims. They did not. Instead, they referred us to the Prime Minister's comments today in Aberdeen, which, of course, repeat those very claims. I also highly recommend this excellent video essay by the YouTuber Second Thought, which discusses how and why renewable energy sources are actually cheaper and more economically advantageous than fossil fuels, but why capitalist economies persist in choosing fossil fuels against seemingly all common sense. Before I talk for a little bit about Second Thought's video, I will also point out a recent report by the International Renewable Energy Agency, which found that energy production by renewable sources is cheaper than using fossil fuels, and that the cost to produce energy has been dropping by about 15% each year using renewable sources. The excuse that we need to rely on fossil fuels to the extent that we currently are is just that an excuse. The basic gist of Second Thought's video is that while the price of solar energy has collapsed dramatically in the last 50 years, being cheaper than coal, which was the cheapest energy source by far 13 years ago, due to extensive studies for startup costs allowing the production cost of the energy to decrease by 89% between 2009 and 2018, 
This cheaper and more sustainable energy source still hasn't taken over from oil. He argues that the energy transition to renewables, despite their lower price, has stagnated because, despite that price, they still aren't managing to be profitable, as the International Energy Agency was finding that the industry's investment, deployment and profits were stagnating around 2018. He points out that the fossil fuel companies' pledges for energy transition didn't actually lock them into full transition. Shell, for example, made their transition dependent upon these conditions. Firstly, that society would follow through on the Paris Agreement, and secondly, that renewables would provide them with an 8-12% to return on their investment. However, Second Thought argues that no one could ever actually expect that kind of return, citing a number of papers which mention that very few projects, in solar for example, make a return of more than 5-8% to on their investments. This means that Shell's promises never need to be kept, and they don't need to make these commitments to invest in renewable energy, while oil and gas are still extremely profitable. The profit-at-all-costs nature of the increased continual expansion of the fossil fuel industry dramatically exceeds their urgency to combat climate change. I don't want to spoil too much of Second Thought's video, because it really is one of the best videos on this topic that I've ever seen, and I don't want to detract any views from it. But the key argument brought up in that video is that all of the case studies demonstrate that these companies are only making their decisions on the basis of prospective profit. A transition could easily be made to run our society on renewable energy, but until it is more profitable than fossil fuels to do so, that sadly isn't likely to happen without extensive regulation effectively forcing the transition. It simply isn't in the nature of capitalism as a system to prioritise societal well-being over minimalised wealth, since without profit, not low price, that transition doesn't happen. A cheap energy source is only worth producing to a company, not if it is cheap for the consumer alone, but if it's profitable to the seller. And here in Britain, the government have yet to make a clear stand that actually shows in policy that they value the well-being of the people more than the profits of the fossil fuel industry. The crux of this chapter is therefore no. Not only is this not necessary, but Britain in particular has an alternative path that was devised over a decade ago by the Centre for Alternative Technology. This plan, referred to as Zero Carbon Britain, while more of a thought experiment than a direct policy recommendation, outlines how Britain can be effectively and economically soundly run using entirely renewable energy, discarding gas and oil altogether. While I'm not going to pretend that completely discarding fossil fuels will be as easy as in this report's idealised scenario, I will recommend that every MP reads it and takes on board the reasonable strategies that are proposed to reduce our emissions and focus on renewable energies. If you are interested, I have attached a link to the document in the description. But since these technologies are considered economically and practically feasible, I think it's safe to say that if we start now, we can remove the perceived need for this drilling before it begins. And if that isn't enough for you, I recommend watching this video by Potholer54 on A Conservative Solution to Climate Change. Potholer54 is a trained geologist and journalist who has made countless excellent videos using the science to debunk climate misinformation. Unlike many other people who have vocally dedicated so much of their lives to fight climate change, Pothole of 54 is actually, surprisingly, a vocal supporter of, of capitalism, and has some very interesting ideas about how a capitalist system, in his view, can still help us tackle climate change in a way that, as he puts it, conservatives would like.
In the first nine minutes of his two-part video, which is linked in the description, he outlines first how once the science was accepted that CFCs were damaging the ozone layer and lead in petrol was causing humans severe health issues, the necessary regulation that followed drove the free market to force companies to innovate to create alternatives to these problems. The problem that I have with this analogy is that, despite the science of climate change being settled for far longer than it took politicians to set regulations demanding that this innovation take place on the aforementioned issues, this hasn't really happened to the same degree. If companies were forced in all situations to leave at least 60% of any oil they found in the ground, and forced to stop exploring for more afterwards, I would agree with Potholer54 that this might well force companies into rapidly focusing on solutions. But the political will has been less strong because of the amount of time it has taken for many of the effects of climate change to manifest to a degree that people in much of the Western world are starting to really notice. And this has allowed many conservative politicians to both deny it and come up with all manner of justification for disagreement. Eventually, the effects become very obvious, as they are starting to become now, only when horrific damage is already being done, and significant sea level rise is inevitably locked in, and set to cause horrendous damage to coastal communities even if we fully stop climate change. That is to say, from the outset, I don't really agree with Potholer54's interpretation that capitalism holds the solution, and a lot of his points are, indirectly at least, debunked in Second Thought's video that I previously discussed. That said, it is very much worth watching Potholer54's video, particular for how he clarifies that extensive development of the green energy sector in China is being performed because it makes economic sense to do so, since the effects of climate change threaten China's economic progress, which means that it makes sense for a capitalist system to start rapidly investing in and developing energy sources that don't make the problem worse and help them to stop emitting so much. It is fundamentally under this argument anti-capitalist then to argue that countries should be doing nothing about climate change, since that leads to extensive damage being done to a country's economic growth in the long term. Potola54 also argues that if you take tax breaks away from the fossil fuel industry, it suddenly becomes much more expensive to produce them than it does to produce solar or wind power per kilowatt of energy generated. So again, providing these tax breaks to the renewable energy sector promotes it to become cheaper still, and allows more money to be put into research to help make the renewable sector more efficient, until the subsidies can be removed altogether. This can allow us to generate solutions to the storage of excess power from renewables when the renewable energy inputs, like sun or wind, are being intermittent due to, for example, weather conditions. So, whilst I do have issues with Potholer's videos on, on this matter, it is clear that with sufficient pressure to innovate, such as would come through strong regulation and legal restrictions on extraction, a capitalist nation should still be able to come up with a solution for Britain's energy needs, and can even utilise the competition ingrained into capitalism to enhance the efficiency of that solution. Potholer even points out that the first politician to vocally push forward the need to act on climate change was shockingly, the British Conservative Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. Now, I am not going to pretend to be a fan of Thatcher, I am so much not, but I am going to say that conservative economic systems should not fundamentally be opposed to action on climate change. So, why are they? Well, in addition to what Second Thought discussed in his video that I talked about earlier, there are a number of other possible reasons why policies like this, which hinder our ability to act on climate change, 
might be enacted by the British Conservative Party in particular, and I'll talk about that in part 5 of this video. But before I do, I want to discuss an issue that might really help Britain to achieve net zero, and that is by enacting policies to ban private jets. More private jets both take off and land in the UK than in any other country in Europe. Some members of the ultra-rich are using them to travel as little as 5 miles, distances that can easily be driven or even potentially walked, to produce a tiny, tiny fraction of the emissions released, or none in the case of walking. In 2022, according to a report on the CO2 emissions of private jets in Europe by the environmental consultancy company CE Delft, which is linked in the description, the most frequently flown journeys were all less than 500 miles in distance, all of which are journeys that could easily be taken on seemingly any other mode of public transportation and have a much lower carbon footprint or even non-public transportation. Trains, for example, release at least 80% less CO2 per passenger than planes. And that's only when compared with commercial aircraft. According to this study by the European Federation for Transport and Environment, private jets release 5 to 14 times more CO2 per passenger than commercial jets and release around 50 times more CO2 per passenger than trains. According to the aforementioned Sky News article attached in the description, there were 1,343 flights between London and Farnborough alone last year. That is a journey that could be taken in one hour on a train, and would save 50 times the carbon emissions. According to the findings of the CE Delft report, in 2022, private jets caused 5,377,851 tonnes of CO2 to be released in Europe alone. As one of Europe's major political powerhouses, we could substantially reduce that by banning the landing and taking off of them here in the UK. Heck, the UK released 501,000 tonnes of CO2 from over 90,000 private jet flights last year, and that was almost double what was released the previous year, with emissions from private jets being shockingly found to rapidly be on the rise in Britain, according to the findings of both the CE Delft report and the European Federation for Transport and Environment's report. If we as a country banned private jets, we would erase that from our emissions cycle completely, plus the emissions that would have been released by arriving private aircraft, which would also be several tens of thousands of tonnes at least going by the amount of tonnes calculated in the CE Delft report for only the most popular routes to England. There are so many private jets that they now make 1 in 10 flights taking off from the UK, and yet they get taxed less than cars. Yet, Despite climate activists, and even many climate scientists like Professor Ian Hall in this tweet, using this data and arguing that the government make common sense change, not only have neither Shaps nor Sunak even tabled this as a serious approach to help us deal with the climate crisis and reach net zero, but Rishi Sunak flew in a private jet up to Scotland to personally make these new announcements about his plan to use oil and gas drilling to fix climate change, and then used a private jet to go on holiday with his family. A private jet, which by the way, the government refuses to reveal the details on how frequently it's flown or what its emissions are, but which he flies around the country on so often that he's even being called out by conservative newspapers about it.
So I think it's safe to say that this policy of enhancing oil and gas drilling and releasing over 100 new licenses in, in the North Sea in British waters is not necessary and only hurts the UK's ability to achieve net zero. But, I hear you ask, what about the NHS? And what about those 213,000 jobs that Rishi and Grant say will be lost if we don't continue drilling oil? Well, the Conservative Party have extensively cut the NHS, dramatically increasing both wait times and the number of excess deaths, in particular of people from less well-off neighbourhoods. The details of that are presented in this next section of this video, but to put it more simply, putting higher taxes on the rich, ending subsidies for fossil fuel companies, and raising taxes on them, and as some controversially suggest, stopping spending around £350 million a year on an entirely ceremonial monarchy, might all be great ways to help with funding that. But the 213,000 jobs? First, if the UK is going to go from using around 80% of our energy currently coming from oil to around 35% as Rishi Sunak claims, then a large portion of those jobs simply can't exist in the long term under his plan anyway, if he is sincere about reaching net zero. And as said earlier, there is at most 40 years worth of oil in there, if that and that most of that simply cannot be extracted if we are to reach our targets. Meaning that, in the next few decades, these plants will have to start downsizing. This is inherently not a plan that brings job security with it. So if Rishi Sunak believes what he claims, that this is an investment in an industry that will be downsized, then he explicitly is stating that he does not believe in giving those 213,000 people long-term job security. The advantage of renewable energy in this regard is that it doesn't run out, so there is no prospect of downsizing being essential. Replacing these jobs in the same parts of the country with clean energy jobs, subsidising training in these sectors, and providing support for clean energy companies to start work in these parts of the country that currently have oil and gas works would be a great way forward to try to keep these communities afloat. Part 5. The real motive behind all this? Question mark. The thing is, however, the actual reasons behind this announcement might be even simpler than the reasons that Second Thought discussed in his video. In Jonathan Pye's frankly glorious rant about these announcements, a video that I've linked in the description, he expresses his opinion that this is being done in retaliation against the climate-conscious mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, implementing an ultra-low emissions zone in London. This has received a huge amount of outrage by Conservative MPs and the British right-wing press. However, I don't agree with Pi that this childish motive was the main reason behind any of this. Nor do I believe that it's as childish and spiteful as the motivation that was indicated by Shap's tweets, that the decision is seemingly being motivated in retaliation to the disruptive protests of Just Stop Oil. Just Stop Oil have occasionally caused minor disruptions, and even major disruptions, that have at times unfortunately disadvantaged the daily lives of the proletariat. I do not deny that, but this government's public spending cuts caused by the Conservative Party's austerity politics have caused a much bigger problem. They have caused an estimated additional 100,000 to 300,000 deaths, primarily of people in impoverished areas, see these papers which are linked in the description, and dramatically increased hospital waiting times to frankly horrifying levels as addressed in this article by the British Medical Association, which is also linked in the description. So the lives of the working class seem to hardly be a priority to these people at all. Plus, the damage that Just Stop Oil cause is very localised and sporadic in nature. 
If you want to see some very personal content about the problems with the National Health Service or NHS right now, I recommend these videos by Owen Jones, Cinematic Venom, and Philosophy Tube, which discuss very different issues with the NHS, but give a very bleak picture of where it currently is. The Cinematic Venom video is particularly heartbreaking given the status of how unseriously mental health and suicidality are taken, particularly in male patients. The fact that the same party who caused the NHS to be in this state are claiming that part of this announcement to justify increased fossil fuels is going to help fund the NHS is barely comprehensible to me. As for the harm to the working class that ultra-low emission zones in London might cause that are being blamed by conservatives on Sadiq Khan's leftist beliefs, well, the ultra-low emission zones were also originally a conservative plan conceived by former Mayor of London and former Prime Minister Boris Johnson, which the conservative government directed Labour Mayor of London Sadiq Khan to complete. Indeed, the Labour Party, to which Sadiq Khan belongs, don't seem all that keen on low emissions zones, as is discussed in this Telegraph article. So if Jonathan Pye's interpretation and that this announcement was motivated by these low emissions zones is correct, then that would mean that the Conservative Party was spitefully overreacting against Labour because of the plans of the Conservative Party, which Labour don't even really like. It doesn't make any sense unless we view these low emission zones as a plan by the Conservatives before they even knew that Khan would become mayor to sabotage his tenure as mayor. That said, the fact that they are using social media to smear him as a bad leader for enacting their policy means that we can't exactly rule that out, sadly. No. I believe that a much more realistic explanation comes when we look at Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's financial interests. Specifically, the company Infosys, which is owned by Rishi Sunak's father-in-law, with his wife also having a £690 million stake in it. Now, Infosys is a transnational IT services company whom according to investigative reporting last year by Byline Times journalist Nafiz Ahmed, have extensive investments in the fossil fuel industry. This means that they, and by extension Rishi Sunak's own family, directly profit from fossil fuel expansion. They also provide IT services to Shell, a company who spent decades spreading climate change denial, despite knowing from their own experts what damage their industry was causing. The firm is still active in Russia, despite the country's horrific invasion of Ukraine. Infosys even has an entire segment on their website advertising how they help oil and gas companies become, and I quote, industry winners, and it brags about their significant experience working with oil and gas clients and helping them with innovative new technologies to help them optimize their profits. I've attached a link to this page in the description. In fact, according to the Byline Times investigation, Infosys partnered with Shell to create an artificial intelligence that helped them reduce the amount of time it takes to produce a profit off of the oil they extract and save money on labour. So these are hardly people who are caring about the working class. But it gets worse than all of that. You see... Just before the announcement was made, it was reported by the Times of India that Infosys had signed a deal worth around 1.5 billion US dollars to be the primary application services provider for BP, aka British Petroleum. In short, the Prime Minister and his family looked to make a silly amount of money 
from increase in oil and gas extraction and production by BP, Shell, and based on the Infosys website's page on their services to the oil and gas industry, likely a large number of other fossil fuel companies. In fact, thanks to the Times reporting, we know that they also provide services to Aramco, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, and ExxonMobil. To make things worse, the London Economic Times reported that the CEO of Shell has also joined Infosys's business council, just one week before Sunak and Shapps abruptly decided to contradict the evidence provided by every major scientific institution on how best to achieve net zero and how best to go about tackling climate change. If the Prime Minister himself personally gains wealth from the expansion of destructive fossil fuel outputs, how are we supposed to believe that he has the well-being of others as his priority when he tells us that more fossil fuels will help us to defeat climate change? Are we really expected to believe that abrupt, inexplicable decisions like this would have been made during the ramping up of a global climate emergency if Rishi Sunak did not have a personal financial incentive in this decision that just so happened to be timed just one week after the head of Shell joined his wife and his father-in-law's company's business council. I do agree with Jonathan Pye on this, however. We are being gaslit. The misleading figures on the difference in emission between British and overseas gas emissions, as well as the scale by which CCS will help us achieve net zero, are being repeated at nauseam by these politicians in every interview and on countless tweets, and they do not, as I have shown, stand up to scrutiny. This is clearly a tactic designed to make us question reality, designed to make us think that actually using fossil fuels instead of the energy systems recommended by the scientific community is actually what's going to help us survive and thrive. But that is not what the peer-reviewed, robustly tested studies are showing. The academic literature has a lot more value than the NSTA because it is not bound by ideological bias towards profiting from hydrocarbon expansion, and it undergoes peer review. Yes, Dodgy papers do sometimes still come out in that system. We've all seen plenty as scientists. But they also often get responses and rebuttals and addressed in future papers, which overall helps us to gain a clearer understanding of the whole picture. As the IEA have said, any new fossil fuel resource on top of that are incompatible with hitting net zero or limiting warming to only 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial. According to the International Energy Agency themselves, we cannot continue to keep drilling. And until the government can point to articles in the peer-reviewed literature, not from the fossil fuel benefiting groups or groups like the NSTA which are designed to prop up the fossil fuel industry, then frankly I do not believe we should trust their decision making on environmental matters. Part 6. Labour, the Liberal Democrats and Green respond. Now, both Grant Shapps and Rishi Sunak have repeatedly compared Labour's tactics to Just Stop Oil, and even called Labour the political wing of Just Stop Oil. So you might think that Labour are planning to save us all from big oil and immediately revoke all of the new oil licenses that the Conservative Party are supporting when they come to power, right? Well, that would require that the party actually act like the Conservatives are characterising them as being. You know, as reasonable people who actually listen to the scientific consensus on climate change. I don't know why conservatives think that that's bad, but for something that actually is bad, let's look at how Labour is responding. Here we have the shadow leader of the House of Commons and the Member of Parliament for Bristol West, Thangham Debonair, 
talking on BBC Newsnight. She reveals that Labour will halt the offering of oil and gas exploration licences. That seems great, right? Well, it would be. But then she denies that the party will revoke the licences offered by the previous government. As the presenter points out, this effectively means that all of the already approved extraction will still go ahead, and the party is still willing to go ahead with the plans of the fossil fuel industry, at least to some extent. This is hardly something that the so-called political wing of Just Stop Oil would say. So if Labour were to win the election, will you revoke the licences? Well, we will grant no new licences, Kirsty. I mean, obviously, oil and gas is going to play a part in our transition to a fully clean green energy market. But we need to make sure that we're not going to grant any more. It's not OK. The world is on okay. fire. We right. have all seen that this week. And Rishi Sunak is taking us backwards. We're sending very bad signals to business investors, sending bad signals to consumers who face higher and higher bills. And he's not dealing with the climate emergency as it really is. So in effect, what you're saying is you won't issue any new licences, but actually it's job done because actually this government is doing that job for you. So you accept that any licences in place when you come to office and by then there'll be hundreds more licences. You are actually agreeing to this fossil fuel strategy. No, what we want to see is a doubling of onshore wind, a tripling of solar, a quadrupling of off offshore wind, investment in tidal and wave, which are the great untapped sources of power that surround our island nation, and new nuclear. That is a radical and bold way of tackling climate change. What's more, it's the way that we're going to get those great jobs of the future, bring down people's bills, protect our energy security, and tackle climate but change. You, but you're saying, saying that if you come in, if you, can I just clarify this? Because what you're saying is, if you win the next election, you will not revoke these licences. And so therefore, that production in the North Sea will go ahead for both gas and oil, to the same extent that the Conservative government wants it to go ahead. So in a, in a sense, you are pursuing exactly the same strategy. Absolutely not, because the government have forgotten that what we really need to do is, be inv is invest in renewables, which they're not doing. Now, consumers are on our side over this. They want their bills to come down. They've had to put up with a Tory cost of living crisis with mortgages and rents going sky high. We need to make sure that people can see hope for the future with the great jobs that will come with the renewable industry, with that green transition that we need to make so urgently for the sake of our planet, but also for the sake of our health and for the sake of our economy. Too often, too often, um, Tory politicians are presenting this as a choice between either tackle climate change or grow the economy. And the reality but, is, of course, we need to do both yes, hand and in hand. Keir Starmer, Labour leader himself, has since told the Evening Standard that Labour will not scrap planned drilling licences, and he actively distanced himself from Just Stop Oil, calling their demands that we, well, just stop oil, just like the IEA, the IPC, and every major scientific research institute recommends, contemptible. Starmer did, however, say that he believes that the Conservatives are trying to use the environment as a wedge issue for short-term political gain. But he then echoes the same talking points about energy security and needing to continue using these fossil fuels that the Conservatives do. He says to the Evening Standard, the likes of Just Stop Oil want us to simply turn off the taps in the North Sea, creating the same chaos for the working people that they do on our roads. It's contemptible. On the North Sea, Labour's plan is pragmatic and fair. To secure a managed transition, we will need our existing oil and gas fields for decades to come. That said, it's sadly not surprising. As many political commentators have pointed out, under Keir Starmer, the British Labour Party have been consistently removing more progressive candidates and backtracking on the leftist policies that Starmer had previously used to get himself elected as head of the party, reneging on all ten of the pledges he gave about the future of his leadership. I highly recommend the many videos released by Owen Jones that discuss this in detail. Heck, the, even the controversial leftist commentator Vosch recently criticised the Labour Party for their rightward swing, heavily criticising Labour's sharp decline in their support for the LGBT community, in particular trans rights. Nowhere is this more obvious than the fact that Rosie Duffield, an explicitly far-right MP who is engaged in Holocaust denial, is the party's chief whip. Can we trust a party that is increasingly moving towards a conservative ideology with our climate change strategy, when conservative and right-wing or right-leaning parties across the world are showing a consistent rejection of the steps needed to take action on climate change?
editing note here, since this section seems to contradict some of what I discussed in my discussion of Potholer 54's video, uh, in that section I was more discussing conservative economics, whereas here I'm more discussing sort of conservative ideology. Conservatism as an ideology is predicated upon the notion of a society remaining in its idealized form, returning to and conserving an ideal yesterday today. But that simply isn't compatible with the rapid societal shifts that are necessary to combat climate change. This ideology must therefore be combated within the Labour Party. We need system change if we are going to fully combat climate change. I turn now to this clip of George Monbiot. I mean, what we have to do is a big structural political economic stuff. You know, what, what we're being told to do is change your cotton buds and all these like, pathetic micro consumerist bollocks, which just isn't going to get us anywhere. You know, there are one or two things you can do as a consumer which do make change, switch to a plant based diet. That's one big, big change because animal farming has this massive environmental impact. Another one, stop flying. Yeah, but, but beyond that, actually everything we have to do is change the system. We have to overthrow this system which is eating the planet, with perpetual growth. I mean, since when was GDP a sensible measure of human welfare? And yet everything that governments want to do is to try to boost GDP. Now, people like the OECD or the World Bank say, oh, we're not asking for a lot of growth, just 3% a year. That means doubling in 24 years. Yeah, we're bursting through all the environmental boundaries and screwing the planet already. You want to double it? Double all that? Double it again, keep doubling it. It's madness. We've got to find a better way of measuring human welfare than perpetual growth. We've got to start ramping down all fossil fuel production and leave fossil fuels in the ground. And at the same time, and this is a nice bit of it, it turns out that through massive rewilding, ecological restoration, you can draw down a load of the carbon dioxide we've already produced. Huge amounts. Allowing the forests to come back, the marshes to come back, um, the sea floor to recover from trawling and stuff. They draw down carbon dioxide and can take us a long way towards stopping climate breakdown at the same time as stopping ecological breakdown. There's time, but we can't do it by just pissing around at the margins of the problem. We've got to go straight to the heart of capitalism and overthrow it. The Liberal Democrats responded to the announcement by tweeting about BP and how the company had made a £2 billion profit during a cost of living crisis amidst climate change. They called the Conservative government completely out of touch and said that they had got their priorities wrong, and frankly, I completely agree, but their tweet doesn't say that they plan on revoking those licenses if they come to power. The party leader, Ed Davey, has not, to my knowledge, addressed this announcement himself, but he did tell the Press and Journal last year that he wants Britain to completely stop drilling for oil and gas and focus on renewable energy. So it's possible that he didn't respond because he's already made his stance on the matter clear. The Green Party responded by characterising the Conservative Party as climate criminals, claiming that the new projects will lock the country into a fossil fuel driven future, and criticised Labour's lack of leadership and their refusal to revoke these licences if they come to power. Carla Denyer, co-leader of the Green Party, had this to say in an interview on BBC Radio Bristol. I'm afraid what's really worried me is that uh, last night on TV, Fangham Debonair, the Labour MP for Bristol West, said that while Labour wouldn't be granting those oil and gas licences if they were in government now, they won't rescind them when they are in government. So basically what that means is that they are OK with the Conservatives approach on energy and that they want to see more oil and gas expansion because otherwise if they made a promise now that they would rescind those licenses in government then it would make investment in those projects not financially viable and it would accelerate the transition to renewable energy as well as all of the measures like insulating people's homes to bring down their bills which we need to tackle climate change and to help people through the cost of living crisis. Part 7. The Petition. Write to your MPs. There are at least two major petitions active right now calling upon the government to not issue these announced licenses for oil and gas drilling in the North Sea. The one on the government's website has reached almost 12,000 signatures at the time of this recording, and as the one on the government's own website, I think this is the petition that is most likely to be taken seriously by the government and the one that is going to be brought to Parliament. So it does need a lot more signatures, and if you feel strongly on this matter as I do, please sign and share it. 
Greenpeace also has a petition online which has a very impressive 290,000 signatures. And I'm also attaching this one in the links in the description and encouraging you all to support it. We can also write to our MPs, sharing the facts of this matter with them if they support the Prime Minister's announcement, and making a plea to them on behalf of the planet. If you are an MP and you are watching this, especially if you're a Conservative MP, which I know is particularly unlikely given my tone towards your party, then thank you for putting up with my arguments, which may have been very annoying at times. I would really like to deal with these issues in good faith as an honest discussion about solutions. But wherever those solutions are, they cannot involve maxing out our fossil fuel output when the only way we can prevent this ongoing mass extinction is to leave an absolute minimum of 60%, preferably 75%, of the world's oil and gas resources in the ground. At very least, ask your MPs if they will be willing to commit to enacting regulations that ensure no more than 40% of that oil is removed, that none of that oil will be liquefied, that none of that oil will be transported overseas. Preferably ask them if they will ensure that at least 75% remains, based on the IEA's report, um, or to the condition that the licenses will immediately end upon the removal of 40% of the oil and, and or gas that they find. If we dig up that gas, then just send it to someone else for them to burn, and then claim because we aren't the ones personally burning it, then that means our emissions have been reduced, whilst we allow and actively encourage by selling it the burning of that oil and gas to happen, and acknowledge the enormous carbon footprint of compressing, liquefying, and transporting that gas, if we claim that that isn't increasing our carbon footprint, we're lying. Please, if you're an MP, listen to the scientists who have studied the planet's climate system for decades. Not the NSTA, not the fossil fuel companies, not the Murdoch-owned media, Listen to the people who have no financial incentive to mislead the public. Listen to the peer-reviewed papers in respected journals and prioritise their findings over those of the NSTA and the companies which profit out of burning fossil fuels. Listen to the communities of people who are already being hurt by climate change. Listen to the IPCC reports, which synthesize decades of research on climate change, and use that resource to both inform about the risks of climate change and about how we can deal with them, and make direct policy recommendations about how we can solve the threat. The IPCC report on the mitigation of climate change is linked in the description, as is a huge amount of the stuff I was talking about in this video. And if you have questions as an MP, just reach out to the researchers who know about the field and ask them for advice. Ask them if you have any questions about their research. And even if you seem to find contradictions between research and studies, ask! We don't expect you to have the time to read every single major climate-related report or paper, but you should at the very least be aware of what they're finding and seeking to do all that you can to do better, to protect the lives of the people whom you were elected to represent. Nobody benefits from an unlivable world. Nobody lives on an unlivable world. The Sunak government are clearly going out of their way to mislead the public, repeating the same claims over and over and over again, as though doing so will magically make what's false true. And if you're an MP, especially if you have biases towards Shaps and Sunak, 
I can really see there being a chance that you have actually sincerely been misled by that repetition, thinking, well, they say it so many times, it must have been based on something for them to have checked and know that they're telling the truth. But it's not true. In the description, there are tons of articles you can read about topics discussed in this video. Please, do not give our in to this gaslighting. If you are an MP, now is the time to stand up for all life on this planet and challenge what has been announced. To everyone else, thank you very much for watching. Next time, we will be going back to the Prehistoric Planet Review series for more fun with dinosaurs as a bit of a cool-off after how serious and sadly dour this video was. I created this channel to educate and entertain rather than politically campaign, but I hope you can see why this particular issue was worth making an argument on. If you're interested, whilst I was finishing this script, I just saw Chris Packham's incredible response to being questioned about these announcements by the folks at Politics Joe, and he makes a lot of really great points about the ways we can transition away from fossil fuels and help people that are affected by low carbon emissions zones, as well as point out even more problems with these announcements and the Conservative Party's reasonings that I didn't even find when I was working on my script. I highly recommend checking that out, and I've added a link in the description. If you are struggling to deal with climate doomerism, I've heard really good things about this new video by Sophie from Mars dealing with that, and I've linked it in the description. I am thinking of making a separate channel for talking about more political issues that don't pertain to earth science and climate. Uh, please do let me know if you like that, because I think you can tell I have a lot of thoughts there. But if you want to see another political video from me right now, I recommend checking out my video on colonialism and paleontology, which is also linked in the description. On my Patreon, you are now able to vote for which video you want from me next, after the Prehistoric Planet review. Options are what are slow slip events, climate change in coastal wetlands, and Irritator, let's repatriate the world's most annoying dinosaur. If you want to support future videos, please do so on my Patreon, or support me via Ko-fi or buy my merch on Redbubble. Thank you again very much for watching, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.